The Cauldron film shows the new technique which we first tried in 1952 in the Hebrides. We went again to the Hebrides in 1953 while looking for a better site. We'd been in the West Indies on Operation Harness in the winter of 1948 to 49, but it was generally too windy there, and we believed that further north in the Bahamas would be very much better. Operation Ozone was carried out there in 1954. This film is mainly about the differences from the earlier operations and doesn't repeat the detail which I have already given in the Cauldron film, which you should have seen before this one. Operation Ozone was linked with the UK by Hastings aircraft of the RAF through the Azores and Bermuda. At both these places we were very well looked after by the American air bases. They enabled us to handle toxic material like this and also the animals in safety and security. The main snag about the airlift was the difficulty of getting a useful load across the long hop from the Azores to Bermuda. And so through Bermuda and on to Nassau. Last night and the night before. Last night and the night before. Last night and the night before. My mama got drunk. She wouldn't get drunk no more. People leave New York, you are the wonderful song of all their last song. You park a truck, you take a little trip to see their last song. Now, when you go and come again, don't get to bring along all your friends to their last song. Their last song, you have a wonderful time in our song. You take your work. To drink you some booze and let last song, let last song. You take you a trip to get you a sip and let last song, let last song. Champagne and whiskey, a lots of beer, you can always get it. All we here and let last song, let last song. You have a wonderful time in our song. While drinking in a hotel bar in Lel Nassau, Lel Nassau, smoking a big ten cent cigar in Lel Nassau, Lel Nassau. While you watch your cocktail mix, you come right here and get it fixed. Having arrived, we'd better look at the inevitable map to see where we are. I've designed this map specially to show the remarkable extent of the Bahamas Bank, which lies just below the surface. The bank is outlined in blue-green and the land in brown. Florida is over here and this is the Bahama Bank with its many scattered islands. Nassau here is the only possible base for supply and communication. We wanted to pick a place within about 60 miles of Nassau. We'd explored the eastern bank of the tongue of the ocean and settled on a site near Green Key, which is the only place where this stretch of the bank emerges above sea level. When on the site, we were linked to Nassau by amphibious aircraft. Ben Lomond moved down to Green Key, about five miles from the site, so that the aircraft could land in the sheltered water near the island. The Grumman Goose arriving from Nassau with mail and fresh provisions and maybe passengers. A goose eye view of the touchdown. Goose Day was always a big event in our isolation there. Letters and newspapers were, of course, eagerly awaited. It was necessary to use a whaler to get alongside the goose, which usually tied up to the stern of the ship. If the goose had to land some way from the ship, 
Stores were transferred from the whaler to a motorboat. This is a consignment of toxic material just derived from Dietrich. All the suspensions used during the season were flown down to Nassau by American aircraft. And so, back to Nassau in about half an hour. When the Hastings brought a load of animals, they were transferred by goose, direct from the airfield to Ben Lomond in Nassau Harbour. This way we were able to avoid advertising the use of animals. Motorboat provided our main link with the shore using the Imperial Lighthouse Services private jetty. The inspector's courtesy in making this available to us was very much appreciated. The adjoining commercial wharf is always very crowded. The Hastings on its way back to the UK with return stores and passengers. We must get back to the map for a bit. We chose a site on the eastern side of the tongue of the ocean because of the prevailing east winds. There's a 20 mile clear downwind uh, here and vessels very seldom pass this way. And also Andros Island isn't inhabited in this region. The site is protected from ocean swell in all directions by the bank, which also discourages all but a few small craft from using the tongue of the ocean. The site itself is about five miles north of Green Quay, to which we went once or twice a week for recreation or to meet the goose. Then once every couple of weeks, Ben Lund sailed up to Nassau to meet the Hastings aircraft. To get back to the story, the pontoon got here in mid-January, followed shortly by Ben Lomond. The pontoon had been towed from the UK by the tug HMS Warden. They met very heavy weather and the pontoon was severely damaged. Extensive and urgent repairs had to be made to the hull and machinery by the ship's staff and the local shipyard. It was a most remarkable achievement to have it ready again only three weeks late. Here it is, leaving Nassau Harbour for the site in the tow of Warden. Ben Lomond can be seen behind. You can see the control hut and the arc of sampling points under their protective covers. Warden seen here on the site just before she sailed away. We were sorry to see them go a great help and excellent company. One big change in the pontoon since Cauldron is the control hut which you can see here. It's tilted because the pontoon is listed ready for a trial. Preparing the pontoon you may glimpse two of the naval party, our unobtrusive hard-working stage managers. In the control hut the controller sits in full touch with everybody by loud hailer, radio or telephone. The hut has a very well filtered air supply so that the controller needn't wear a respirator. I can assure you from experience that it's a first class arrangement. Here he sits with all the controls under his hand and a clear view of everyone on deck. The controller is, as I said, in radio communication with the ship, not only the bridge where the captain is during trials, but also the laboratory, so that they are in continual touch with the trials and can take instructions about details of assessments. Now some detail about the other main subject of this film, long-range trials. While the pontoon is being prepared, the trials boat lies alongside. The yellow contraption up at the top is a radar reflector. A sprayer for decontaminating the float at the end of the trials is attached to the stern of the motorboat. 
and on the canopy is the reel of air hose and towing wire. The boat moves to a safe position upwind while the trial party put on respirators and then charge the spray. The spray used in all the long-range trials was a normal two-fluid spray operated by air at 100 pounds to the square inch and putting out about 100 ml a minute. About a litre of the agent under test is being added to some globigii spores which act as a tracer. Sample being taken for subsequent assessment and then the spray is assembled. The float on which the spray is towed behind the trial's boat. It is linked to an air cylinder in the boat by an air hose lashed to the towing wire. The float is dragged down to near the base where it is to be launched. The air connection is prepared and then the spray is fixed to the float. The motorboat closes on the windward side and heaves a line over. The float is attached to this and launched. All this is not an easy manoeuvre when the sea is at all choppy. Indeed, the condition of the sea is the limiting factor. The boat takes it away and connects up to the airline. The spray working. Not a very good shot this time, as you can see. This is about a couple of hundred yards off. We actually had many good hits at up to about a mile, the longest range that it was necessary to use. The range of the spray from the pontoon was determined from Ben Lomond by compass bearing and radar range. The radar range, which was easily accurate enough for our needs, was combined with the bearing on a chart with the pontoon already marked on it. And the distance from spray to pontoon read off. The boat used smoke puffs and other wind indicators to get the float directly upwind to the pontoon. And Big Ben, our wind direction indicator on the pontoon, was a great help. The controller could guide the boat with a simple director keeping his eye on Big Ben. This worked very well. Ultraviolet light measurements were made during most of the trials. The spectrograph in use here, designed by an amusing coincidence for measuring atmospheric ozone, presents the ultraviolet spectrum through a wedge onto a photographic plate. Although there's very little UV shorter than 3,000 angstrom, it appears to be pretty potent as judged by the rapid decay of airborne material. This was also found in experiments in which material was exposed in impingers on Ben Lomond, where rapid killing proved the need for the impinger shielding that had been fitted. We had also to consider the effect of heat on men. It was important to see that on arrival out there they were properly acclimatized before taking part in trials. A remarkable difference. There was actually no trouble, though in May, when it got fairly hot, one or two workers were near the limit of endurance. The worst place was not on the pontoon, but inside the ship. We did have some guinea pigs die of heat stroke one hot afternoon on the pontoon, but they'd arrived from the UK only four days before. Doesn't this make a contrast with the enormous amount of clothing on Operation Harness? Of course, it wasn't always hot and sunny, and rain, when it came, was pretty heavy. And brisk winds did blow, making quite a lop even inside Nassau Harbour. But generally, at any rate in the first half season, we got the 
expected moderate and steady winds. With these two helpers, we are able to do more good experiments than in any previous season. Some very satisfactory work was done on the downwind travel of two bacterial agents and one virus, giving answers of quantitative significance much better than in the previous rather disappointing season in the Hebrides. These and other results fully justified the move to more remote waters. Turning briefly to some other aspects, Green Key provided modest facilities for recreation, swimming, or birds and insects for the naturalists, or just the change of going ashore. There was, unfortunately, not much scope for anything else on this little island. There was one very good reason for not bathing over the side. And there were less uh, strenuous recreations uh, like this. Halfway through the season, we put up discouraging signs on the pontoon and went to Jamaica for a few days for fuel and provisions. Broke up the people from the police came on board and take him away. They take him to jail. They take him to jail. Without any mail. I feel so break up. I want to go home. Four days at Kingston and then back to Nassau for the second half season, ending early June. When Ben Lomond sailed, the pontoon was left behind at Nassau to be ready for another season in November 1954. I stopped the jumping sail, let's see how the pencil set. Send for the captain, show, let me go home. I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home, I feel so great.